Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about the future. Woohoo! And it's not just because the present seems so very, very depressing. <laughs> Also because we have some things we want to say about the future. Tense. Before we start, very briefly, want to say thank you to a couple of new Patreon supporters who have joined us in May. So thank you very much to Kevin Lyon and Colin Lyon. Woohoo! And now I want to bring in the cocktails. The cocktails are very special this time, and I will explain it to you in a bit, like 25 minutes from now. <laughs> Let mystery. Me, let me go get the cocktails. Okay, I'm seeing component parts here. This is this is a deconstructed cocktail? Not exactly. The cocktails are fully mixed. But just describe what you're seeing. All right. So there are two glasses, rocks glasses, which have the drink with ice, but also slices of banana. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, there are more slices of banana on on the tray on which the two drinks are resting. Which is a... A silver tray. And as well, there are almonds and coffee beans on the tray, as, as if they're a sort of additional accompaniment somehow to the drink. And there are skewers, large toothpicks or small skewers, resting in the drinks, waiting presumably to incorporate some of these extras. All right. Well, I'm not going to tell you anything about this cocktail other than its name. This is the Avanvera. Avanvera. Okay. Right. This is the Avanvera cocktail. Go ahead and drink, try some. And uh, you don't need to add anything else. The skewer is to help you eat the banana slices if you need to. Okay. That's all it's for. Let's start. It's sweet. Mm-hmm. Now, you know it has Italian vermouth in it. Right. It also has brandy. Okay. And has strega. Strega. Okay, I was going to say there's some, from, from the name, I was going to guess there's an Amaro or something, but. And, as you say, slices of banana. So it's a perfectly tasty cocktail. Yeah. The banana is weird, but not unpleasant. Mm -hmm. All right, I will tell you nothing more about it. Okay. <laughs> until the time is right. All right. So explain what we're going to be doing otherwise today. Okay. So this is one of our podcast episodes based on a previous video. And that previous video, which is called Does English Have a Future Tense, is itself based on previous work, what I might call the previous work. <laughs> it's largely drawn from my doctoral dissertation, which was called The Conceptualization of Futurity in Old English. A fine ringing title. Yes. <laughs> Draws the punters right in. <laughs> <laughs> Which was basically, it, its starting point was, how does Old English, the earliest written form of the English language, how does it handle future tense constructions? Because, as you'll see, the future tense is not something that was originally part of the English language, and yet they had to translate a bunch of Latin texts, which did have future tenses. And so how do the translators handle this both linguistically and culturally? Because it's a culture that doesn't have readily available future tense construction. So were they thinking about the future tense in the same way or a different way or whatever? And so it kind of feels like I'm going back in time and revisiting this topic. It's perhaps of little surprise that my favorite ever since I was a kid franchise is Doctor Who. And as it turns out, my one of my, well, probably my favorite movie is Back to the Future. So I've been thinking about time travel basically my whole life. So I've since then kind of made a career out of looking at time and language, both in this dissertation topic and in other ways in my research since. So we're going to, first of all, listen to the audio from the video, our usual <laughs> awkward way of referring to that. And then I'm going to expand on that, or should I say I'm I'm going to, or I'm gonna, or I'm a expand on it. I don't know. You don't no, get to say I'm a. Actually, I will talk about that. You know, yeah, I know, but you briefly, don't get to say it. <laughs> I don't get to say it. I'm gonna. It's probably the most natural way for me to say it. I'm going to go into some more of the detailed grammatical background of this topic 
going a bit more in detail specifically about Latin and French. And, and, and this is really for those of you who are like me, real grammar nerds. So I'm going to talk about some really nerdy specific grammar stuff more in detail. Now, of course, this is only going to scratch the surface. So if there are any real keeners out there, let me know if this is something you'd want, but I could make my dissertation available. <laughs> you to we'll read. send the dissertation to any interested parties <laughs> and anyone who's not interested as well. Cause boy, oh boy, <laughs> once you've written those things, yeah. the idea of anybody ever reading it is really exciting. <laughs> it, it's apparently been referenced by someone as groundbreaking work. As, as Avon pointed out to me. Yeah. Google Scholar is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so breaking ground on some really niche nerdy topic, topics. But you know, that's, that's what a PhD that's is for, that's frankly. Fine. Yeah. I'll take it. So, you know, yeah, if you want to read more, there it is. And in addition, I will also talk later on about the history of timekeeping, which is a topic that I find kind of interesting. I don't go into any great detail about it now, but it's a topic that I might come back to later because it is a very interesting topic. And in addition to that, there will be upcoming episodes that come back to the issue of time and language. So there will be another episode that will deal with my more recent research into spatiotemporal metaphor. And, and so that's like really up-to-date stuff that I'm researching, as well as uh, several episodes that will deal with sort of the calendar and related subjects. So lots of, lots of other timely content to come. In the next year or two. Yeah. It'll take a while, but over the next yeah year or two, you'll, there'll be more <laughs> episodes on time. So we'll, we'll keep coming back to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And I've got some other things to throw in, but not a lot. And I will explain the cocktails. I'm so excited uh, about the cocktails. <laughs> so for now, let's listen to your discussion of the concept and grammar of the future tense. Okay. You've probably always been told that there are three tenses, past, present, and future, right? Like I loved, I love, and I will love. So why am I telling you that English has no future tense? Well, in Old English, as was true with all the older forms of Germanic languages, there wasn't a future tense at all. There were just two tenses, the past and the present, or more properly, the past and non-past tenses, since you would use the non-past what we conventionally call the present tense, for indicating both present actions and future actions. We can still do this in modern English, like saying, I go to the doctor tomorrow. And in subordinate clauses, we never use the future tense. As in, if it rains tomorrow, never, if it will rain tomorrow. But if we want, we can specify that the action of a verb is in the future by using auxiliaries such as will and shall, as in, I shall stay home, or he will go to the doctor. So, can we call these constructions future tenses? Well, maybe, but there's a lot of disagreement on this point. First of all, as we just saw, the future tense isn't grammatically required to express the future. We can simply use the present tense forms. Furthermore, if we look at the etymology of the auxiliaries used to form future constructions in English, it appears that they may carry other meanings in addition to future time reference. So will comes from Old English willan, which generally meant to wish or desire. Though already in Old English, Wielan was just beginning to be used to express futurity. It goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root with largely the same meaning. One cognate of will is the word volition, which comes into English through Latin. So some would argue that even today there is some slight element of wishing or volition in the modern English auxiliary will. Similarly, shall comes from Old English shulan, which meant to be obliged, have to, must. And again, although it was already beginning to express futurity in Old English, it can be argued that even now it still has connotations of obligation or necessity. Wielan and Shulan are part of a set of verbs called modal verbs, which express mood or modality. In simpler terms, elements of possibility, obligation, permission, ability, and so forth. Other modal verbs in modern English include can, could, may, might, ought, and so forth. They all sort of qualify the action of the main verb in some way. One way of thinking about the future, then, is as occupying the intersection of tense and modality. And the word future itself, by the way, comes from the Latin futurus, the future participle of the verb to be, which comes from the Proto-Indo-European root bewa, be, exist, or grow, which also gives us the English verb to be which makes sense since these English will and shall forms were called future tenses by grammarians who were trying to fit English grammar into the model of Latin verb forms, 
even though they don't really work the same way. But here's where the interesting connection comes in, which will take us on a trail that will eventually lead back to our English future construction. At the same time as will and shall were first starting to be used to express futurity in Old English, there was an ongoing philosophical debate most explicitly expressed in a highly influential late Roman text, which was often read, recopied, and translated in the Middle Ages, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. The debate was whether people had free will, or whether the world was governed deterministically, in other words, did God predetermine all of creation in one go. It's all kind of about the nature of future events. Boethius comes down on the side of free will, but the important thing to notice here is that the two options in the philosophical debate, free will versus determinism, parallel the two modal connotations of our two auxiliaries, willan expressing volition or free will, and shulan expressing necessity or determinism. When the Old English scholar King Alfred the Great translated the Consolation of Philosophy into Old English, he was very careful how he employed Wielan and Shulan, with attention to their modal connection. Now of course, it's impossible for me to summarize the entire history of this debate, which still rages to this day, with such questions as to what degree our own brains predetermine our actions, and is free will simply an illusion. But I want to point out one particular stop on this path, the debate between Catholic Erasmus of Rotterdam and Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism. Because you see, this was one of the sticking points between the Catholic tradition and Luther's fledgling Protestant church, whether salvation was a reward for your actions in life, or a predetermined gift from God. In a series of writings aimed at one another, Erasmus and Luther debated this question, Erasmus on the side of free will, and Luther on the side of determinism. You see, the Catholics, believing in free will, not only accepted good works as a way into heaven, but also took to selling pardons, basically get out of purgatory cards, in order to make a little money for the church. Luther thought this was corrupt, and figured only the elect, previously chosen by God, get into heaven. What you did during life wasn't the cause of your salvation. So thinking about the future helped to start the Protestant Reformation. Getting back to King Alfred, he also translated one of the philosophical works by St. Augustine of Hippo, the Soliloquies, basically an inner dialogue which explores the nature of the soul, that doesn't get very much into matters of time. But another of Augustine's works does. The Confessions is essentially an autobiography, in which Augustine describes his misspent youth as what we would now see as a troubled teen from a good family who acts out in a variety of antisocial behaviours, the whole wine, women, and song routine. Some things never change, I suppose. In his Confessions he famously encapsulates his feelings at the time with the line, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. Eventually he cleans up his act and converts to Christianity, becoming one of the four fathers who basically established much of the groundwork for the Western Church as we know it today. His autobiography ends with some reflections and commentary, which we might now recognise as an early attempt at cognitive science, when in Book 11 he turns his attention to time and how we perceive it. He starts off with an oft-quoted statement about the difficulty of discussing the subject, musing, What is time then? If nobody asks me, I know, but if I want to explain it to someone asking me, I do not know. Well I know I often feel that way, so again, some things never change. He then goes on to discuss the very familiar and conventional three-part way of looking at time, with a future that in the instant that is the present is converted into the past. As we've seen, this three-part division isn't the only way of looking at it, but for Augustine writing in a Roman Christian context, this is pretty standard. The Latin verb system has three tenses, past, present, and future, and the Christian sense of history moves inexorably from creation to judgment day. But the particularly clever bit is what he does next. He collapses all three times to cognitive operations in the present moment. It is now clear and plain that neither things to come nor things past exist. Nor do we properly say there are three times, past, present, and future, but perhaps it might be properly said there are three times, a present time of past things, a present time of present things, and a present time of future things, for these three such things are in our souls, and I do not see them elsewhere. The present time of past things is our memory, the present time of present things is our sight, the present times of future things our expectation. So, that's another way to think about the future, expectation and prediction. By the way, it's not entirely clear whether Augustine sided with the free will camp or the determinism camp, but the Protestants certainly read him as expressing a deterministic viewpoint, and adopted him as a kind of grandfather of the Reformation. 
But what is clear is that all this comes down to how you divide up time, and that makes sense given the etymology of time. The word time originally meant a limited space of time, traceable back to the Proto-Indo-European root da, meaning divide, which came into Old English as tima. Tide, teed in Old English, also descends from this same root, meaning originally a time or season, as in Yuletide. Time gained its modern abstract sense of time as an indefinite continuous duration only in the 14th century. Tense, on the other hand, is a tricky one, but according to one proposed etymology may have to do with dividing up. First of all, there are two words tense in English, which may or may not be etymologically related. Tense as in a verb form, and the adjective tense as in tension. What seems immediately clear is that tense comes from Latin tempus, which also means time. This Latin word may come from the root tem, meaning to cut, so in other words a segment of time. Or it may come from the root ten, meaning to stretch, so a stretch of time. And relative to these tense words, or maybe not, are the words temporal and temple, which both also are two separate words in modern English. Temple can mean a place of worship, or the area on the side of the head. Temple the place of worship may come from the tem root, from the notion of a space cut out, or therefore reserved, as a place of worship. Or it might come from the ten root, from the notion of stretching a string to measure out an area of worship. The other word temple, the area on the side of the head, may come from the stretching notion because of the skin stretched out over that portion of the skull, or it might come from the idea of time, as in the appropriate time, in other words the right place for dealing someone a fatal blow. What's more we have the two words temporal with the same set of confusions, temporal referring to time and temporal referring to that part of the head, most often used to refer to what lies underneath that spot, the temporal lobe of the brain. Complicated etymologies, but we better move on or we'll run out of time. Speaking of the temporal lobe, though it doesn't specifically have anything to do with time, one of its functions is language processing, specifically in the area known as Wernicke's area, named after Karl Wernicke, which is responsible for language comprehension, as opposed to language production which is handled by Broca's area in the frontal lobe. It also turns out that there doesn't seem to be one time centre of the brain, but rather many distributed systems, one of which is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, a tiny region in the hypothalamus which regulates the daily circadian rhythms. Other brain areas that are particularly important for our purposes are the frontal lobe and prefrontal cortex, which are implicated in planning and voluntary action, operations in the domain of the future. This sounds a lot like Augustine's present time of future things. And what about Augustine's present time of past things, which he sums up as memory? Well, that's also a crucial function of the brain, particularly the hippocampus, originally literally horse sea monster, then subsequently used to refer to seahorses, and then to the brain region because of its similarity in appearance to the seahorse. The hippocampus is part of the temporal lobe, and is involved in converting short-term memory into long-term memory. And as it turns out, memory may play an important role in thinking about the future. The human brain seems to be uniquely capable of what is called mental time travel, remembering the past and predicting the future. What's more, we draw on our memories for the raw material for constructing possible futures. Brain imaging shows that remembering and imagining the future use very similar regions in the brain's frontal and temporal lobes. We may have developed mental time travel, as well as language, for the evolutionary advantage it gives in being able to plan future actions. Now sticking with the scientific approach, specifically as it applies to prediction, there is the field of future studies or futurology, an interdisciplinary field about predicting the likely futures we may encounter, based on looking at past and present trends and extrapolating into the future. Science fiction writer H. G. Wells is often considered the father of futurology, which grew out of the book Anticipations of the Reaction of Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Thought, an Experiment in Prophecy, published in 1901 and a Royal Institution lecture he delivered in 1902 and later published called The Discovery of the Future. In addition, there was also an early 20th century cultural movement that had ideas about the future at its core, futurism. Futurists, primarily a group of Italian artists, writers, musicians, architects, and even cooks, looked to the future with excitement and optimism, and to the past with contempt, valuing speed, machinery, and violence led by the founder of the movement, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, who wrote a futurist manifesto. 
In the 1920s and 30s, futurism became entwined with fascism, and Marinetti even founded a futurist political party in 1918 which was absorbed into Benito Mussolini's fascist party a year later. Mussolini championed one of the tenets of futurist cuisine, replacing pasta with rice in Italian cooking. Mussolini wanted to wean Italy off its dependence on imported wheat and onto domestically grown rice. And it can be said that Mussolini not only valued violence but also machinery and speed, as per the old cliché about him that at least he kept the trains running on time. And Mussolini takes us to World War II where we also find another notable figure in the pantheon of time. If European fascism started World War II, science was there at the end of it, with the invention of the atom bomb, which might have been built first by Germany had Albert Einstein along with fellow scientist Leo Zillard not sent a letter to President Roosevelt urging the US to start what became known as the Manhattan Project. Of course Einstein is most well known for his theory of relativity which cast doubts on the possibility of time travel into the past but showed the way towards time travel into the future. He is also known for his work on quantum physics, becoming dissatisfied with the probabilistic direction quantum physics was taking, preferring instead a more deterministic universe, famously stating God is not playing at dice. But to bring our story back to its linguistic starting point, determinism and relativity also have important meanings in the field of linguistics, specifically linguistic determinism and linguistic relativity, also known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, after 20th century linguists Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf. The idea simply put is that the language you speak and its characteristics either determine, as per linguistic determinism, or in the weaker form linguistic relativity, influence the way you think and perceive the world. This hypothesis is a matter of hot debate currently among linguists as to what extent language does, or doesn't, influence thought, and this debate is largely localized in the category of time in language. Worf, incorrectly as it turned out, believed that the Hopi language, spoken in what is now Arizona, had no concept of time, and so he surmised that the Hopi were unable to think about time in the same way as, for instance, an English speaker does. That's linguistic determinism. Since then other scholars have picked up on the idea, such as medieval scholar Paul C. Bauschatz in his 1982 book The Well and the Tree, World and Times in Early Germanic Culture who claims that as early Germanic languages like Old Norse and Old English had no future tense, merely past and non-past, speakers of those languages would be unable to think about the future, a concept that they only gained through interaction with Christian culture and the Latin language. These are strong claims that many don't agree with. More recently, economist Keith Chen claimed in a 2013 article that whether or not a language has a future tense distinct from its present tense can affect future-oriented behaviour, such as saving money for the future. Basically, his argument goes, languages which grammatically distinguish the present and the future may bias their speakers to distinguish them psychologically, leading to less future-oriented decision making. So how we categorize our English future verbal constructions might have an influence on how we think. However, after much criticism, Chen has backed away somewhat from his bold claim, while weaker forms of linguistic relativity have been tentatively identified by some cognitive linguists. But this is a controversial subject and is definitely a topic for a future video. And in fact, you actually did come back to that one for once. Mm. <laughs> when you've promised future videos, you haven't always carried through. But that is one of the ones we will be yeah. talking about. That's I, the spatio-temporal metaphor I stuff. I do keep coming back to the topic of time and language because it is my obsession. <laughs> and also linguistic relativity. And linguistic relativity, another obsession. Yeah. Yes. But that's for another day. Okay, now I can explain the cocktail. Mm. So this cocktail, sir, is a futurist cocktail. I was wondering that, you know, what, what could possibly be weird, <laughs> you know, weird surprise. And so there is that culinary element of yes. the so, futurism. You mentioned the futurists, mm -hmm. who of course are horrible fascist people. So, uh, yeah. you know, the fact that we're making a futurist cocktail, just for the record, does not mean I approve of or are excited by the futurists necessarily. Boo Mussolini. Yes. Boo Mussolini. But that said, one of the things about futurism was, I'm quoting now from a website that I will, there was a bunch of stuff about this, but I'm reading from an article on the whiskeyexchange.com. <laughs> I will link to that. The core of futurism was a love of the modern and a rejection of the past. With, mm -hmm. And with Italy's strong food and drink traditions, it was only natural that a new approach to those would be part of the movement's ideals. Ah. And as you said, like the stuff about pasta, doing rice because they could right. grow rice and they couldn't grow enough wheat. So 
Mussolini was very concerned with specifically Italian foodways. That was an important thing. Who, what, where they going to eat? And the futurists were two in different ways. And they put out a futurist food and drink. The first work on futurist food and drink was La Cucina Futurista, the futurist cookbook by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. Right. Founder of the movement. Yeah. Yeah. Published in 1932, mainly concerned with food, but it also contained the seeds of the futurist approach to drinks. It was all about the artistic side of cooking and an obsession with appearance, with elements of dishes created just to be seen and smelled and the surroundings and influence on the experience. As part of the reconstruction of the gastronomic world, they renamed elements of the menu using tradui rather than sandwich. Peralzarzi, I can't say Italian, instead of dessert, calling their cocktails polybibite. <laughs> multi drinks, many drinks. Mini. The environment for the development of polybibite was very restrictive. So they had the Great Depression. After the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, there were trade embargoes. So for nationalistic futurists, this pushed them to using predominantly Italian ingredients, but fitting in with the movement's ideals, using them in new and untraditional ways. They mixed drinks that were usually drunk on their own, added non drink ingredients, and generally disrupted the concept of the traditional cocktail. So they've divided polybibita into six categories based on what the drinker was intending to do after consuming the drink, rather than based on what they were doing oh. while having it. So not what food you were pairing with anyway, it, but what, f- what, what f- you were going to do next, next. what it was going okay. to prepare you Pare for. You for. Okay. So the per mangiare was for eating, so aperitifs. Right. Guerra in letto, war in bed, was to get you ready for sex, sex. because they were very <laughs> keen on families having children. Yeah. Pace in letto. Peace in bed was warming to give you a good night's sleep. Mm-hmm. Presto and letto, fast to bed was to put you to sleep really fast, like heavy alcohol. Right. The snebianti, a fog dissipator, a strong cocktail to remove conformist thoughts and open the mind to new ideas. <laughs> and inventine, inventive, a very alcoholic cocktail to in- unlock the mind's potential for invention and problem solving. Mm-hmm. Now, in their recipe books, and descriptions, they didn't give full recipes because the whole point was this sort of artistic, nonconformist way. But so right. I have followed a recipe that has been sort of constructed out of this description, but I will read the description of this particular drink. The cocktail itself is a mix of vermouth, Italian brandy, strega and sliced banana poured without measurement and then combined however the bartender wanted. The glass was served on a polished metal platter surrounded by Ethiopian coffee, bananas and almonds representing Italy's overseas colonies. And, and I did not do this, tomatoes, anchovies, and Parmesan cheese, standing for the country's homegrown produce. Huh. I didn't have those in easily. I could have. I decided against the anchovies, which is the only bit I could have done. To accompany the drinking experience, someone might regularly beat a sonorous sounding gong. Someone else might spray perfume behind the drinkers. And there would be an opportunity to handle textured materials, sandpaper, wood, metal, soft and rough fabrics, to make sure that the sense of touch is being properly stimulated. So there were a whole bunch of other recipes that I found, all of which were more weird or terrifying. And one of them had a cooked egg yolk sitting in a sweet drink. Anyway, this one was the only one that was A, achievable and B, sounded like I would drink it. (laughs) So This obviously has had continuing influence. In short, it makes Hester Blumenthal's dinner parties look tame is what this article says. (laughs) Right. Yeah, well, I think it may be, I don't know if it had continuous influence, if you see what I mean. Like, I think mm-hmm. it kind of stopped being a thing, but but I don't know if they're doing that deliberately for mm. futurist. But yeah, it's it's in many ways seems very ahead of its time, but that's the 20s and 30s. Well, like yeah. that lots of stuff happened then that didn't... It's kind of the point if you're futurist, right? You're supposed well, to be looking ahead of your time. And but, yeah, a lot of stuff got put in back in boxes for the 40s right. and 50s and mm-hmm. 60s, right? So what I have presented you with, therefore, is an approximation of this. We didn't have Italian brandy. I uh, used the wrong vermouth, but, you know, it was an Italian vermouth. So it's 30 mil brandy, 30 mil vermouth and 10 mil strega, except I doubled them and then slices of banana. And I was able to put three of those in the overseas colonies are represented on the platter, but right. not the Italian food. So it's a perfectly nice drink, but really the drink is not the point. It's the presentation. <laughs> right. and, and the history the and the concept yeah. and the idea of it. So... I was so excited when I found that (laughs) because I mean, there are a few other cocktails that had the word future in them or whatever, but I just thought, no, this, right. This is a future cocktail. (laughs) This is exactly it. So, well, that's very cool. (laughs) (laughs) And it it, it occurs to me though, it's interesting that they call it poly bibita Mm -hmm. rather than multi bibita because that poly is the, the Greek prefix. I guess it came into Italian 
I mean, I don't know enough about yeah. how Italian forms, whatever, but it must have made it into, you know, become a mm-hmm. naturalized Italian word mm-hmm. or prefix, which wouldn't be surprising because yeah. so many of those words come into Latin. All right. Switching gears. The one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit in reference to other things you brought up before you talk more about the grammar was the concepts of the future. So you talk obviously about that with the Germanic and the Latin yeah, uh, and the sort of not clash necessarily, but the the meeting of those particular conceptions of time. But the Latin conception of time you're talking about is a late antique slash Christian conception of time that has yeah. is founded around Christianity and its theological sort of implications of time. So I thought I might just talk a little bit about some of the ideas about time in the ancient world pre-Christian. Specifically, really, I'm I'm just going back to Rome, though. Whenever you talk about Roman philosophy, you're talking about Greek philosophy too. Right. There were many, many different conceptions of time because there are a lot of different philosophical schools and approaches. But I thought I'd look at it a little bit through the lens of Virgil's Eclogue 4, the Messianic Eclogue, because right. that one kind of brings yeah. together a bunch of these ideas, not in a coherent, thought out philosophical way, but kind of touches on a bunch. And this is talking about the conception of time in the sense of the future, like where is the world going and how does the movement of time work? Mm-hmm. There was the astronomical concept of the Magnus Annus, the mm-hmm. year. Cicero talks about this in his Republica. This is the period between successive occurrences of all celestial bodies being in the same positions, right? So right. The, this is a little bit like the Mayan calendar, yeah, yeah. the idea of like everything coming back to the starting point. Hence, therefore, that's a cyclical idea. Now, that doesn't necessarily conceptualize time as the world is ending and starting again or something like that. But this idea that sort of the time does move in a cycle, that it comes back to the beginning and it starts yeah. again. I mean, in many different cycles on many layers. So yeah. This is the big one. This is the big one, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like There's lots of little cycles, yeah. but this is the big one where it all lines up again mm-hmm. and then starts again. There's the Stoic idea of the periodos, period, which is sometimes combined with the Magnus Annus. And this periodos is the time between successive conflagrations that destroy the world or the universe. Mm. In the Stoic cosmology, this is not as a punishment, like apocalypses in other concepts, but as an expression of the world's essential divinity. It basically reaches its summation of the creative fire of the cosmos. So it's kind of a culmination of its divinity, really. Mm -hmm. And then it will, because it's the creative fire of the cosmos, it will start again. So the world ends in fire and then begins again in fire. So again, a cyclical idea. So sometimes that idea of the astronomical concept is connected with the Stoic idea to say that the periodos is the Magnus Annus, that when everything comes back to reset, the world will be destroyed and restarted. Then there's the Orphic doctrine of the world ages, each ruled over by a different god. So Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto, and finally, and to come, not yet here at the time, Apollo. That would also end with a conflagration. Now it's unclear in our extant sources whether that was thought of as a cyclical or repeating sequence or as a one time only. Whether it's teleological or cyclical is not clear. Our Orphic stuff was mystery stuff, so it often is not clear in our sources. There's a Roman concept that was probably Etruscan, because a lot of these things are Etruscan, but again, hard to tell, of the cycula. Mm-hmm. The cycula is the period of time it takes for all members of one generation to die, so that cycula begins when nobody is re- alive who remembers the last cyclum that was marked. Right. Towards the end, middle and end of the Republic was formalized as 110 years, as being a cyclum. And there's a concept that a nation's natural life cycle is 10 cycula. Okay. The rise and fall of, of people. Right. Right. So Rome or Greece or whatever. Again, not necessarily completely cyclical because it's not like you go back to the beginning and Rome starts again or something. But it, this idea of repeating patterns. Uh, and of course, there were the secular games that happened. There's also the concept of the ages of man from mm-hmm. the golden age down to the iron age, either gold and silver iron or golden heroic silver iron, sometimes bronze is in there too, different versions yep. found in Greek myth and Hesiod. And it's also in the elsewhere in the Mediterranean. So we see it in Babylonian and Near Eastern mythology. In Italy, the golden age is often connected with the reign of Saturn or Kronos, mm-hmm. who after his overthrow by Jupiter fled to Latium and ruled the last. So the golden, the last sort of gasp of the golden age was in Italy, according to that story. In Eclogue 4, so the Eclogues were a collection of poems. The first collection we have by Virgil written during and 
to the end of the civil war between Octavian and Antony before and after and during that period of time, so around 30 BC probably is when they were finished. He suggests the idea that they might be in the Iron Age and it could begin again with a golden age. So Eclogue 4 is about the becoming of a new golden age. This is not found elsewhere in the extant sources, so we don't see that idea of a restarting elsewhere. That doesn't mean it didn't exist, doesn't mean Virgil came up with it alone, but it might have been his new concept. He brings all of these ideas, basically, that I mentioned in one way or another. He alludes to all of them in Eclogue 4, not, as I said, in a coherent full theology or cosmology, but he references a bunch of these different ideas of changing ages, cycles of change, rebirth, regeneration, restarting in Eclogue 4. He also brings in, of course, the apocalyptic figure of the divine child, mm -hmm. maybe born to a virgin. It's not entirely clear the way he puts it. Of course, that's how the Christians took it later, but in the actual poem, it's not that clear. There is a virgin mentioned. It's not clear that's the mother of this child. That idea is very common in Near Eastern and in Jewish sources, so it's quite possible he took them from Jewish sources, though that's all speculative. We don't have direct connections. I mean, there's but, a lot of this stuff yeah, floating around exactly. at the time. At, so. at the, it's hard to know where he took it from. Yeah. But he doesn't show us a concept, like a, a, a concept of the future, mm -hmm. but he does bring in all of these ideas of the ending of one and the beginning of another. And for him, it's the beginning of a new golden age. There's going to be a gradual bettering of the world, which right. is in many ways a reversal because what we've seen in Greek and Roman thought, there's this idea in general of degeneration. Right. Where stoicism, for instance, is unusual is in the idea that this will start again, like that there's a, a restarting, that this will be an ongoing cycle. The ages of man is usually portrayed very much just as a basic total degeneration to misery. So Virgil is kind of putting these all together to say it has been down. I mean, he's been going through yet another civil war. Civil war is forever and ever. Eclogue 4 is all about the hope for the rebirth, the new golden age that will bring peace and prosperity and many colored sheep which is the most important part of the golden age. So that's what we have in Virgil. The other piece, I just wanted to mention this. It doesn't really talk about future, but I think it's interesting to you for other reasons. So I thought <laughs> I'd just mention it. Lucretius is another person. He, uh, he writes, of course, the De Rerum Natura, which mm -hmm. is an Epicurean philosophical text written as an, an epic poem. And so if you're going to look for philosophical ideas, you might as well look there. And he does talk about time. He has a sort of basic cyclic view, not again, formalized or worked out, but mm. But his cyclic view is, is because it's atomic theory, death and decay are necessary prerequisites for new creation mm. because death is the dissolution into the atoms. Right. And you need that so that you can have the atoms and, for recombination yeah. and new life. So that's a cycle, but it doesn't deal directly with the idea of cosmic time and that kind of thing. Okay. Because the whole idea is that everything's accidental in okay. a sense, right? The accidental meeting of atoms. So that sort of larger theme is not make sense. But I thought you'd be interested in, he does talk about time. Lucretius defines time as an accident of motion, tempus item per se non est. Time itself, by itself, does not exist. Right. It is motion that causes time, which of course is something I mean, that's that people the modern like, physics it, it, way yeah, of looking absolutely. at it is yeah. that time is just a byproduct of thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's, it's it, I mean, as always, the atomic theory of the Epicureans is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I have two articles that I will also link in the show notes if people want to read more about it. And I'm quoting from one by Gisela Burns. Throughout Lucretius's philosophical poem, time is spoken of as space, as motion, and as force. And this article is asking the questions, what is the connection between these three different metaphors of time, between time as mm -hmm. space, time as motion, and time as force. Huh. And two, what is the common ground for this poetic view of time and the philosophical definition of it as accident of motion? And I just thought I'd mention that to you <laughs> because the fact that this article and it seems like quite a few discussions of Lucretius about what metaphors he uses Jesus, for time yeah. that have to do with motion and space, I just feel like Which I should point that out to you. Which is very much the, the topic that I'm researching now yeah. is how time is figured in language in terms of space and motion. Yeah. So I have no, I, I did not look further to see if, you know, this is really relevant or not. I just thought I would point that out to you and I can give you the references right. later. <laughs> <laughs> and you can look into that because it does feel like it's, you know, because that's, as I said, this is a pre-Christian, it's not 
relevant to your discussion of how time metaphors develop in English, because I doubt that this is a yeah. distinct... At what point are they reading Lucretius? Yeah, no, I don't exactly. know. <laughs> and when it is, it's never popular. Like, it's yeah. probably not an important factor in how English developed its, its concept of, of time. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. it might be interesting to you. So that's all. That's what I wanted to talk about for futurity. Right. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I think what I want to do is kind of go back to real basics here and talk about some of the nuts and bolts of grammar mm -hmm. and how it handle, handles tense, mm -hmm. verb tense. And so as a comparison to the English futural constructions, it's useful to look at how tense works in a language that certainly does have a grammatical future tense, right. namely Latin, which is a language that had very specific influence on English. So for the verb amare, to love, the present tense in the first person singular would be amo, I love. To make it a future tense, you add a different ending. So that O ending is the present tense first person singular. Mm -hmm. So you change that ending and you get Amabo, I will love. Mm -hmm. So one word on its own can express the basic idea of futurity right. in Latin, right? You, yeah. All you need is that one word and change Definitely the form formed, of that one word yeah. and it changes that idea. Yeah. Unlike English, where it would be will love, where you have to have two words to do the job. Though I will say it's not a necessary conclusion that a form being Other produced with a single word, it isn't necessarily essential to grammatical tense as a concept. Right, right. So as we'll see, there's a lot of going back and forth between one form and two and words language as, as language yeah. develop. So let's then jump forward from Latin to one of its descendant languages. And I'll use French because that's the one I know, but this is more or less true of other romance languages, romance languages <laughs> that come from Latin. So in French, because there were some sound changes that happened as you go from Latin into what's called vulgar Latin, so a sort of later development of Latin. So a certain sound change happened that made it difficult to, to distinguish between that future tense, so ama bit, let's say, she will love, and the past tense, ama wit, she loved. Right, the B becoming the B the, and the V. The the V becoming a V. v, v yeah. So it become it used to be Emma Wit. That was pretty clear. Once it became Emma Vit, it involves the the very lips. Close. Yeah. It's very you and know, the B was probably softening too. Yeah. And yeah. So that obviously causes the potential for misunderstanding if you can't tell the difference between the past tense and the future tense. So that pressure caused the development of something more clear. So vulgar Latin dumped the one word future tense and started using an auxiliary verb. So now we're into two compound. Yeah, a compound. So two words to make the future tense rather than one word. And so specifically they use the auxiliary verb habera to have to form this new futural construction as in Amare habeo. So literally, I, I have, have to, to love, love, I guess, but really it meant I will love. Mm -hmm. Then what happened was that the auxiliary habeo got kind of simplified. And this is the thing that French really does, but all the Romance languages do to some extent, but French was really great about dropping consonants. <laughs> Dropping as many syllables as possible yeah. and then making the rest silent. Yeah. <laughs> so that habio was no longer, you know, very clearly pronounced. pronounced and it got simplified and then glued on to the end of the main verb, the infinitive amare. And so eventually what that produced is in modern French anyways, j'aimerais. Aimerais. Yeah. Emere. Yeah, yeah. The, the je is the pronoun. Yeah, I will love, mm -hmm. which is how a French speaker today would say it. So that ere is from habeo. Well, the re. The re, yes. The yeah. er is from the infinitive, presumably, right? Yeah. Um, amare. Amare, yeah. So we're kind of back to where we started with one word expressing mm -hmm. the tense. The funny thing is, in addition to this one word future tense, which is called the futur simple in modern French grammatical terminology, French also developed another future construction. So there are two different separate futures. Separate compound future. Separate yeah. compound future, which is called the futur proche with the auxiliary verb aller, to go. So je vais 
am a, I will love. I am going to love. I'm going to, to love. love, literally. Yeah. Is this where I get to rant about Duolingo? No. I'll, okay, you will. I'll, I'll yes. I'll I'll, 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 I know yeah. that it's coming. I just want to know yeah. when. <laughs> so the distinction between these two different future tenses, future sample and future posh, was originally about how distant a future you wanted to talk about. So as the name suggests, future posh was for the near future, something that is going to happen imminently, and the future sample was for a more distant future. But really today the distinction is more one of formality, so less formal for the future simple and more formal for the future proche. Really? The future proche is more formal? More formal. Huh. I, in talking to my child, for instance, he only uses He's the future, future proche. proche. Well, and I wonder if that is dependent on dialect. Well, I don't, I don't know. Context. When, same with me. When, mm. when, when I learn, like in learning French, and this is very much as an Anglophone in Ontario. So yeah. I'm a hundred percent not trying to say this is how French works. Yeah. Right. So neither well, of us are native French speakers. No, at all. So I can't, I mean, I've spoken French my whole life. My French is decent, but I have no intuition about mm -hmm. it necessarily, or at least I wouldn't trust my intuition, but I would say that in spoken French, I hear and expect and certainly use the aller plus the infinitive all the time and very rarely use the future simple. Well, maybe My, that's because we're sort of taught more proper French. And, I think and it's just because it's easier. French you it's it's use. much easier as a form to learn, yeah, I guess. right? Because you learn the aller. Mm -hmm. And then you just stick the infinitive. Yeah, yeah. But if anyone listening grew up speaking French and has a strong intuition about it, I would like to know. I mean, mm. I'm not I'm not denying what you're saying. It's just does not match with my experience. But my that's, experience is in a French as a second language. Right. So, well, that's what I've read grammarians say about. Right. But but you know that may not be. And, you know, and maybe maybe it's true in France and not true in Quebec. These are also things that are mm -hmm. hard to know. So now, if you wish to, think well, about it's. It's not really about Duolingo, other than I am doing French Duolingo to refresh my French. And Duolingo, it's just, you know, it's an app, so it can only be as smart as it can be. And sometimes it's overly persnickety about how you translate when there are multiple translations. It, I will say it's pretty decent about allowing multiple possible translations, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not. And I got thrown by, it would not let me translate equivalent of j'aimerais mm -hmm. as I am going to love. And then when I complained about this on Twitter, because I could not, un like, I genuinely had no idea why it was saying I was wrong. I was like, mm -hmm. it's the future. I know it's the future. I translated it as the future. And people said to me, no, you could only translate je vais aimer as I am going to love because that's not a real future. So clearly they were being taught je vais aller is not future. It is I am going to love. A present. People said, I don't know, because you can't translate j'aimerais as I'm going to love because there's no verb for going. Yeah. Okay. Right? That's and, and like, not I, the like, best explanation so, you know, but, this, but it was interesting to me that that yeah. was cause more than one person said that. They said, no, well, you can't. That would be je vais aller because that has the verb for going in it. So mm -hmm. clearly that is how it's being taught. And my brain was like, that's not how this, <laughs> that's not how any of this works. I don't understand. But just to say, I was told by various people that future proche, the, the people who have been taught how to translate are taught that je vais aller or je vais aimer has to be translated, has to be translated as I am going to love. And j'aimerais has to be translated as I will love. Okay. That that's the only actual future. And that's what they're taught. Well, and there is an argument to be made. Oh, this may be the opposite argument though. That I will love in English is not as much a purely futural construction as I'm going to love. Yeah, that's the opposite. This is the opposite. But there is, I think, some, and I think it's more complicated than that, and I haven't really looked beyond the medieval well, English. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there, there are differences in when you can use I will yeah. love and I'm going to love. Yeah, but I will just also point out that those are not the only two future constructions in English, and we can come back to this point, yeah. and we should, but like, I shall love, 
I am about to really future crush seems to me if the if the whole point is how close it is, it should really be I'm about to love. About to love. Because yeah. that's the much more that's Immediate the how you future. say in English if you want to say like this is happening now. Yeah. There's lots of different ways to do the future. And the idea that there's a one-to-one correspondence right. between the two verbs is what and what I realized after that conversation was that I was never taught to translate French. Right. Because yeah. I learned French in a sort of it wasn't an immersion, but it was an immersive approach where we only spoke French in the French classroom. When we read French, mm-hmm. when we did our French grammar, we did it in French. And I was never taught any rules about this is what the English equivalent of this French is because we weren't allowed to speak English in our yeah, class, yeah. in our classrooms. So a, a lot of the people who were responding to me were either Americans or, or British people. Who learned who it learned as how, a second language. Learned it very, very much as a second language yeah. with like, here's mm-hmm. how to do, here's what the English translation for each of these things is. So I'm not saying they're wrong. But I was very genuinely completely baffled by that. Like never once had I ever conceived of there being some like formalized difference between those. I mean, obviously, I know they're two different forms in French, but like to me, I I also thought of them as formal, but reversed. I thought of the je vais aimer as the informal spoken way and that when you were writing, you'd be more likely to say j'aimerais. So anyway... I just found that whole thing fascinating, you know, frustrating because I got something wrong in Duolingo when I was mad at that, <laughs> but mostly fascinating. And it was interesting to hear people saying, oh, no, this equals that when I know that that's not how the future tense works in either language. Right. Yeah, it's not I, so simple. I mean, it, it may just be a question of you the, give them rules. And I looked it the up. The resolve tense has to be equivalent to the resolve tense. And, and the it, one word has to be equivalent to the one word. Except it's not one word. We have no one word future in English. That's the no. whole point. Yeah, right. So they're both compound in English. It's just one of them has a bare infinitive. One has a full infinitive. So whatever. That's the thing. There is no easy equivalence. But I do understand making these rules. And when I looked it up on the internet, it was quite clear from like French learning sites. This is a rule. This is the way it's taught. I get that. Mm -hmm. I just had never seen it. I'm sure I've seen them translated that way in in grammar text, but because I don't think of those as different things in English, I don't think as I'm going to love and I will love as being like formally different. I know that I would use them in different places, but I don't think of them as being formally different Futures. Well, and, and this so, is the uh, thing is that, you know, in language, the idiomatic use of tense construction mm-hmm. or really any construction grammatically is so much more subtle mm-hmm. than. Here's a rule. Yeah. yeah. Follow it. So I, because, you know, I may have seen them always translated that way, but it would never have twigged to me that that, like, I would never have noticed the pattern because those are equivalents in my head. Or not full equivalents, but, you know, equivalents that are so complicated mm-hmm. when I use one or the other that I would never think of them as being. It's not as simple, in other words, as, for instance, you know, in English, I have seen or I had seen. Right. To me, those are like, yes, I can see those as completely different categories. Those are different tenses. They mean different things. I have no problem saying that, of course, you, you can only translate the plus que parfait with had. Right. Sure. Totally agree. Because to me, that's completely different tense. Whereas those variations on the future are just different ways of saying the future yeah, in English. So anyway, that's, but that's all to I mean, say this is what the complexity in, in of English. It is. And I'm curious to know how it's taught in ESL courses, right. right? Are they taught formal distinctions between these different future forms? But I no. certainly can't remember any time that I've ever told, you know, when to use. Oh God, no. I will, as opposed to I'm going to, or anything like that. The I will and I shall was probably taught at one point. Which is a fake rule. Yeah, (laughs) fake. No, but I'm sure it was in Canada. Nobody says I shall, essentially ever, or uses the shall ever. So we're not taught that. In other words, there may be English speakers who are taught that particular rule still. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but not here because nobody uses it. I think if it ever is used, shall is just used across the board as a more emphatic form. Yes, exactly. And it's no longer this, you know, first person uses shall and second and third uses will. And Except then flip, flip them it for the emphatic. other thing. Yeah. Now I think shall is just always emphatic and will is always the normal. Yeah. So. And and no one's ever taught that. Like no. no, at no point in my schooling did anyone say, here's when you use will and here's when you use shall. Mm-hmm. They taught me will if they taught me anything, which they didn't because we all came into kindergarten knowing how to make the future tense. And they probably never mentioned the go future. So. No, no, exactly. None of this was ever discussed. But yeah, it would be interesting to know mm-hmm. more. And, you know, does how formally that distinction is taught depend on what language you're coming from? Yeah. Right. If you're coming from a language which only has one future form, do you just get taught? 
here are the five ways, you know, like once you're teaching Latin, there's only one future form other than the future perfect, but there's only one future. And so you teach students, you can translate this future form as any of these futures in English. And it's equivalent, right? yeah. Yeah. And here it can be or any of these. Figure it out from context, Just like the present but, tenses, yeah. you say, ammo can be I love, I am loving, I do love. Yeah. Those are all possible translations. Whereas if Latin had multiple presents, then we'd probably tell them which one matched with mm -hmm. which. Although I guess the other question is, what do you do when you're teaching someone whose native language is a tenseless language, yeah. like say, you know, Mandarin Chinese, yeah, yeah. Mandarin? How rules do you do decide? You what which... rules are you given to decide that? You know, complicated. Well, and this is why teaching ESL is, is a really very hard. different thing than just teaching English. Yeah. Like, just because I know a bunch about English grammar doesn't mean I'm under any illusions that I could teach ESL. Yeah. Okay. So that's my rant over. Okay. Keep going on the grammar. All right. So as I said, that was a kind of funny thing that Latin started mm -hmm. with one word, split to two words, and then came back to one word. The even funnier thing to add to that, though, is that the original Latin future amabo was itself originally two components. So right, it just keeps right. going back and forth. So it was originally created by having a form of the verb to be, which comes from the Proto-Indo-European root bewe, to be, exist. And then that got glued on to the present tense verb. Right. So that's the bo bis bit. The ba mm -hmm. is the b. Mm -hmm. It's related to the English word be. It's from that root bewe. So that's what that so, little whole D thing be. is. Yeah. Yeah. To love I be. To love I am. Yeah. Basically. I am to love. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is a way you could talk about the I'm future in yep. English. Yep. I am to love tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I am to shop tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We don't say it much. It's a but it is fashion, but it, but you could, it you is could say like that. it is meaningful. Mm -hmm. If somebody said, I am to write a test tomorrow and I'm really scared about it, you would have no problem understanding mm -hmm. that. And of course, the word future itself, that comes from Latin, a form of the Latin verb to be, futuris, which is the future, future parts. participle. And that comes from a suffix form of that Proto-Indo-European root, so butu. So that's why the T is futuris. And that, that B sound at the beginning in Proto-Indo-European, it's an aspirated B. And so... It becomes an F very easily. It becomes an F very easily. Now, Latin had another set of futures and it's, it's sort of, it seems sort of random, which one in a way, why well, does one go one way and the other goes I the mean, other way, but there it is. Let me be clear about this. Cause if you don't do Latin, this is not clear. It's not that the same verbs have two ways no, of forming the future. You do either one or the other, but depending it on what conjugation and what that means is yeah. different verbs have different vowels in them. Essentially yeah. have different vowels in their endings. And depending what vowel pattern they have, they conjugate differently in certain tenses, in all the tenses, basically. Well, so stemma. here's the way it works is the first and second conjugation verbs have those B endings. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bow, I will love, and um, I'm a bit, she will love, and so forth. And dake bow, bow yeah. and dake bit. bit. That's the second yeah. conjugation with the E in it. Yeah. And then third and fourth conjugation verbs have endings like Audi am, I shall hear, and Audi et, she will hear, right? Mm -hmm. Where they change the vowel before their yeah. final consonant. So you don't have this extra little consonant in there as a clear marker. Instead, it's just a, a vowel, vowel change, change. Which is very irritating when you're learning Latin, just for the record. The well, bow bis bit is much, it's much It's so easy to spot. You <laughs> yeah. can't confuse it for anything else. And well, that's kind of the point because those third and fourth conjugation future forms look suspiciously like the subjunctive mood. Yep. Audi am. They're the other way around. So they're annoying. It's, yes. <laughs> the future and the subjunctive are one of the sources of pain for people learning Latin. Yeah. I'm just going to say. <laughs> so for the, the fourth conjugation Audio, you would have Audi am. I shall hear, I will hear, or Audi et, she will hear, but the subjunctive forms would be Audi am, exactly the same, yeah, yeah. but it would mean were, were I to hear, yeah, or were I, I to may hear, whatever, how you, however you, you subjunctive know, is an impossible does translation. Does a bunch of yeah. different things. And Audi at, so it's not Audi et, but it's very similar, Audi at. And the normal present for those ones would be Audit. 
Yes. Just the I yeah. with no other vowel. These details are not very important, but the important thing is that the subjunctive and the future look very similar in the third and fourth. They and, are flipped vowels. Basically. And that's no accident. So that's the point is that those futures come from the subjunctive. Oh, okay. And that's why they look similar. This makes me sad and mad. <laughs> well, and so again, this shows the fact that the future occupies the intersection between tense and modality, which mm. is kind of the point about your, will and shall, right? Your point of your dissertation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in a sense, that's what the subjunctive does, right? It talks about yeah. hypothetical things. And yeah. what is the future? It's hypothetical. Yeah. It's just that the subjunctive can also talk about the past hypotheticals, but in a different form, not in the present. Form. Well, and you could say the same thing about the past tense modal. So I would yeah. or should, yeah. right? Do the same. There's the past tense of will and shall, would and should, and they also can be in the, so Used shows the past the tense hypothetical, right? Yeah, yeah. It would have happened if, mm -hmm. but it didn't actually happen that way. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you know, that's that's an important overlap there. Those English modal verbs, will and shall, as I say, they can have past tense forms. Those auxiliaries, should and would. And they can indicate hypotheticals in the past, but they can also indicate future in the past. So for instance, in a sentence like, he knew he would win the race. That's not hypothetical. It was future in the past. It yeah. was future yeah. in the past. At a certain point in the past, he had this future. Yeah. He was talking about the future. And it's also frequently used in sort of biographical writings. Like you would say he would later go on to become mm -hmm. president of the United States. He wasn't yet. Yeah. But he, it would happen future to that point in the past. Yes. So as we saw, French has a future tense form with the auxiliary aller to go. And English can, of course, do this too. The so-called go future, I'm going to love, which is often reduced down to I'm gonna love, which is probably in my dialect. More likely, yeah. I don't think I would ever. But you wouldn't write it Going again. to love. So clearly I, do, I would always say I'm going to love. I think I might say I'm going to the store, but that's, that's different. different. That's yeah. different. So that's, that where, that's, going where, you, yeah, the that's where you see the, yeah. the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we do when it's not a auxiliary, but a main verb. Oh yeah. When it's a main verb, then yes, you're going to say it more distinctly, but yeah. when it's being the future auxiliary, you're not likely to pronounce mm -hmm. it, at least in the uh, version I of English, you, the variety of English that I speak. This is why for the record. English and other grammars, hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, I mean, all figuring out the precise of what is actually going on, just because you can speak a language doesn't mean you understand yeah, what you're saying. No, that's yeah. the challenge of it. And, and which is why it always slightly irks me that a lot of linguists will ostensibly be looking at examples from other languages outside of English, and they will just sort of take for granted the comparison to English as on if the basis they understand of their, English. their own native speaker status of English. And I always say, well, but do you actually do understand, you actually the understand English? what the English is doing? And maybe you should sort of go back to square one and, and look at how English is developing first. So we actually know yeah. what English is doing. Just because you speak English does not mean you understand yeah. English grammar. And that goes for linguists too. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 You've got to have data. If you're, if you're well, making you a claim to, about how about English it. works, you've got to have some support for that. And you just have to have thought about it too. Well, thought about it too, but you're only yeah. one person. If it's yeah. just coming from you, yeah. that's not data. Right. Just your idiolect. <laughs> yeah. So you need to go and look at evidence mm -hmm. to demonstrate how English is actually used. Right. So, yeah. So I'm going to love, I'm gonna love. And that gets reduced down to Ima, as in Ima let you finish. So in some dialects, it gets even more reduced. And this go construction first appears in Middle English and comes about through the idea of going somewhere for the purpose of doing an action. So the earlier examples are like, I'm going in order to hunt. Right. And therefore, I'm going so as I'm to hunt. I'm going to hunt. Yeah. The so as is perhaps more mm -hmm. common in some. So this construction originally implied purpose and that similar to that are constructions like he is to leave mm -hmm. tomorrow, as right, we mentioned, about which uses the verb to be plus the infinitive to indicate a planned action. Or I think of the B1 now as being a required action. He is to write a test tomorrow. In other words, he has to write a test right. tomorrow. So yeah. So as a, an almost a necessity or a, there is a modality an obligation. there. Yeah, an obligation. Yeah. yeah. 
And I think he is to be married on Tuesday. He certainly can't leave the country yeah. yet. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. In old English, I think that use of the inflected infinitive always demonstrates that idea of purpose mm -hmm. or necessity two, or something. Yeah. It's never used as a simple future. Right. So that's sort of a later post old English. I don't know exactly when, but probably middle English right. where that happens. And so speaking of the verb to be in old English, there are actually two forms of the verb to be, one of which kind of disappears from the language right. by modern English. But so in the present tense, and this is only in the present tense. So the first thing I, I suppose to explain is that the verb to be is in English and in many other languages around the world is what's super the, weird. Yes. Well, <laughs> that's it's, the technical term, right? No, the technical <laughs> term is suppletive. <laughs> The real term is super weird. So it's a melange of what were originally separate mm -hmm. verbs and separate uh, roots, separate, separate roots yeah. that for whatever reason, some of them disappeared and they just all got thrown together. And so the forms look bizarrely unrelated because they are kind of unrelated. Yeah, they were so synonyms in, and now they're used for. Yeah. So in Latin, you have the S root, which forms parts of the present like S and Est yeah. and Estus. And then you have the s, the s ones, ones which form part of the present sum, yeah. sunt, and then you have the f ones. Actually, the s ones are come from the same root. Yeah, but they've come through so a different s root. Sunt. It's it's just development of the same yeah, but, root. But they case. are still they still end up being these different forms in mm -hmm. that. And then you have the f root the futurus. The f comes from the b root. Yeah, which you were talking about. So that's what you have for future. Uh, but you also have that for the perfect. So fui yes. twisty. Yeah. yeah. So the future, well, only the future participle, because in fact, the future is the er, ero, er, 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 yeah, er it. Which comes from the S root. It comes from the S. So you have these different, every tense looks like it's different. Yeah. Even though some of them are the same, but some of them are definitely are different. different. Yeah. And then in English, you have... You've got the B ones, and then you've got what are the S ones, the same mm -hmm. as the S ones in Latin. So in Old English, you would have eom. I am. So am becomes am. That's not hard to, to see. Art becomes you are or art, right? Thou, Thou art. art. And is is exactly the same. It hasn't changed. So, you know, she is. Right. And then there is equally for the present tense and in many cases completely interchangeable. There are the be root ones. So there's beo, I am, bist, you are, bith, she is. Mm -hmm. So in most contexts, the S forms and the B forms are entirely interchangeable without any mm -hmm. difference in meaning. But when the verb, so there in some contexts, they do make a distinction. And one of those contexts is when the verb is referring to the future. Mm. So in old English, the beo bist bith forms are almost always used for the future. Whereas the aom art is forms are almost never used for the future. Right. And that is statistically really, really strong. strong. Yeah. You can use the the Bayo bis, Bith forms for the present, but it's not the other way around. Right. 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 So it's for the future, that's the sort of marked form, and you can only use one of them. Now I think in my dissertation, I found only one example of the S forms being used for the future. Right. It's like really uncommon. So this can therefore be used as a way of distinguishing the future tense from the present tense. Right. So the future of the verb to be can also sometimes be supplied by a different verb entirely, werethon, which means to become. And so therefore you can have he was, is, and will be, which is something that comes up in Christian writing, particularly mm -hmm. in King Alfred's Boethius, this idea of eternal, you know. An evermore shut will be. Yeah, a sort of non-temporal existence that can be rendered as he was, is, and bith, using the B form to indicate the future. Or you can say, he was, is, and wereth. Mm. He was, is, and becomes, or really will be. Mm. And this future usage of that separate verb, werethon, might also remind one, for those of you who know German, it is the standard German auxiliary used to form the future tense if you want to make an explicit future tense, like 
English, German, German can also use to. the present. It, it can just say, I'm walking tomorrow. Yeah. But if you want to uh, have an explicit future tense, you would use werden with right. the infinitive of the main verb. And so you might say something like, ich werde haben, I will have. Mm -hmm. One other specialized use of these beo bist bith forms is to indicate a nomic statement. Right. I um, love nomic statements and not just because they remind me of little gnomes, gnomes with little <laughs> hats, <laughs> but also because they're cool. So a nomic statement is a statement of general truth without actual indication of time. It's sort of a tenseless. It's true. Thing. It was true in the past. It will be true in the future. It's it is always, always true. true. It's a statement of general truth. Yeah. The sun is bright. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the, not a very good nomic statement. The sky is blue. Yeah. The sky is blue. So in Old English, you would say that as seo lift bith hauenu. The sky is blue. And interestingly, another way of making a nomic statement in Old English is with the auxiliary shulan, shall. So that's another interesting overlap mm -hmm. between these two things. So as in kuning shall reach haldan, a king shall rule a kingdom. Right. And this is one of these things where when you look at translations, you know, they become conventional translations, mm -hmm. understandable ones. When you read those old English texts, there's the wisdom texts, yeah. right? Where they list off a whole bunch of sort of truths about the world. Yeah. You know, things like a dog follows a scent well or something. Mm -hmm. But the translation doesn't say that. It says a dog shall follow the scent well. And because they're translating, you know, because English can translate it that way, why wouldn't you translate it that way? But it can be very weird to read that when you don't know what they're doing or what that form is. Because if you're a normal modern English speaker, to read a whole bunch of lists of things that say things like the king shall rule in the hall, the queen shall give rings generously, the dog shall hunt well, the whale shall swim in the sea. Sounds like a bunch of predictions in my head, right? Because I don't know that form. And I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. What you're saying is that's how that gnomic form is mm -hmm. formed in Old English. So, of course, the translator looking down then going like, shulen, that's shall in English. We have this verb. Why would I not translate it with this verb? It would be silly not to. But if you don't know that, it's not like that because that's not how we do gnomic statements now. And I wonder if that is, I don't know, but I wonder if that's a, a recent change in English that that's no longer that it was, common. So it was more do. understandable in the past. I mean, maybe because the, I am whenever I talk about these translations, what I really mean is that summer when I was bored and read all of Mark's school texts. Right. So I'm reading like penguin translations. Of, right. So there may be different ways of translating it now. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to look at a more recent translation or, I mean, look at other wisdom, more recent wisdom type literature, or, you know, mm -hmm. how I do mean, people do it? How do now? people do that sort of thing now? Because I mean, if it were me making that up now, mm -hmm. I would say a king rules well in his house. Right. These things are true about the world. Mm -hmm. A king rules in his hall. A queen gives out generously. A, a gnomic statement is done with a simple present, I think. And I guess that makes sense since we don't use simple presents very much for actual normal, actual normal present. You, you would always use, you know, I am, normally, right? yeah. I am walking. You wouldn't say yeah, I, I walk. I walk. You use well, that you to doing? talk. I walk. You know, you, no, you would never weird. say, yeah. You, but I would say, oh, I walk every day or, yeah. you know, how do you tenseless. exercise? Oh, I walk. Which again is yeah, the, yeah, yeah. tenseless. It's, yeah, the, the point is, is the thing this is a do. continuing state of being. Mm -hmm. Like I knit. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I am knitting right now. It means this the is thing a, you do. This is a feature of my identity yeah. is that I knit. <laughs> so maybe it's a, you know, a result of the development of resolved tenses mm -hmm. because you wouldn't do we that in Old the, English. You yeah. would never use am plus a present participle in, in for, a, for a standard no, present. Yeah. That's yeah. weird. You would just use a simple present. Right. So now that we don't, we have the simple present as left over. Sort of therefore, we can over. use that as a gnomic present, yeah. as a gnomic statement, and therefore we don't need the shell. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I keep distracting you, but it's because I find this all very interesting. <laughs> I think all of us love thinking about the language we use. Yeah. It's funny to discover things that you do without thinking about them. Well, in case you were wondering, the word gnomic, it comes through Greek. And it nomikos. is spelled G-N-O-M-I-C, yeah. by the way. That's why I was gnomic, talking about gnomic cats. <laughs> So it comes through Greek gnomikos. I don't know how you would pronounce that in Greek. Gnomikos, probably, right? I just wouldn't. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm a Latinist, okay? <laughs> Anyways, it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root gno, which means to know. 
hence Kno. Yes, hence the spelling of English Kno, which is an indication that the English word no was pronounced with that initial K and gives us not only the word no, but also the word gnomic, not only those two, but also the word gnomon or gnomon, which is the pointer on a sundial. Yes. Yay. <laughs> good, good knowledge of obscure words. That's a crossword word right there. <laughs> and the sundial will lead us to the history of clocks and timekeeping. But before I get into that, do you have any questions? Well, I feel like we've talked a lot about grammar, so I don't want to go too far. Have you talked about all the possible ways to say the future in modern English now? Have we covered those all? So the Oh, probably not. Yeah. I mean, we touched on. So the one you talked about is the go future. And then, of course, the will and the, the shall, shall you talked about in the yeah. video. I'm about to. About to. And that's not just an occasional. No. That's a very common yeah. future. I'm about to do something. And, and then, then the, the other one. The infinitive one. I am to do. I am to do. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing. I mean, I think you mentioned this in the video, but I do think it's worth stressing that actually English just uses the present for future most of the time. Yes. And I think it's like really worth being very clear about that. Yeah. So in old English, it's like 90 some odd, 95% of the time, future time references are rendered with the present tense. Right. And the reason you know it's the future is either context or adverbs. Yeah. And we do that all the time in English. In, in modern English. Yeah, yeah. In modern English. It's, this is it's completely it's, normal. I mean, I'm sure that percentage has come down. Yeah, because we do say I'm quite will, a bit. I will. I certainly we say. But if you think about it, how often in your daily speech do you say I will do this? Most of the time you say I'm going to the store tomorrow. I'm walking the dog at nine in the morning, so I need to be up early. Yeah, Late. I'm going on vacation in June. I'm leaving for the coast tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever, like you just... That is normally how you say it. It doesn't, it's not that the others feel weird, mm -hmm. but if I said to you, what are you doing tomorrow? And you said, I will be teaching a class. That would be odd. It'd be odd. Right? If yeah. I said, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I'm teaching a class. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be the normal I'm teaching a class in the afternoon and I have to make sure that I do da 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 da. Yeah. It would be, it would really be marking something. Like, mm -hmm. so you might say, Oh, I will be going to the store in the morning. So I have to make sure that I need mm -hmm. to do that. Like that would yeah, it's be emphatic. Yeah. Or if I said, will you be going to the store tomorrow? I will. Yeah. 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 You know, so there, there are places where we say it. It's not like it's mm -hmm. weird, but it, it's the marked yeah. use. And so I just want to sort of really, I don't think we necessarily recognize that that in our own speech, because we think that we use the future tense because we know it, we mm -hmm. hear it, we recognize it, <laughs> totally understand it. But I think... If you pay attention to how you speak, you will realize you don't use it that much. And as I said, in, in many types of subordinate clauses, you can't use the future. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. It, mm -hmm. You know, it would not be normal English to, to use a future tense, even though it is referring to a future. Yeah. Can event. you think of one right now, just to give an example of uh, that? There was one, what was the one I used in the video? Oh, if it will rain tomorrow. Yeah. If it rains tomorrow, I will definitely... But I mean, that's I'll definitely drive if it, if it rains tomorrow, right? Yeah. You would never say, I'll definitely drive if it will rain tomorrow. Yeah. That's bizarre. Now, I, I think of those as being conditional, so I don't think of them as being full futures, but that's a Latin. Yeah. That's a Latin tick. Yeah. You know, that has to do with my. Well, it is conditional, but you can't, in Latin, you could. And we, therefore, I do it in, when, when translating Latin phrases, right. we do it. So it seems less weird to me than it should because. When you translate certain, you know, you do yeah. that to make it really clear what's happening in the Latin. So you translate it in this very formal way in English that is real weird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But no one would say that. Okay. So that was one thing I just wanted to ask. And we've kind of talked about the distinctions, but also about how hard it is to say why we use one in place of another why we would say I am going to instead of mm -hmm. I will. So maybe I won't actually ask you to try to distinguish those because I think it's actually really hard. <laughs> well, and it's it's beyond the scope of what I originally yeah, studied, yeah, right? Yeah. My intention all along was, well, originally my intention was I'm going to do both old and middle English. And then I realized that, that was, was crazy. stupid crazy. <laughs> that was way too much. So I just limited it to old English and already that was tough. But I always intended to then I'm going to take this forward through the, the early modern English, English and modern English and 
Wow, it's it's enormously complicated. Yeah, yeah. So so I won't ask you to tell me that. Yeah. What I will ask you about, though, you kind of touch a little tiny bit on this, but basically, what was the what do we think was the tense situation in Proto Indo European? Proto Indo European didn't have tenses; it had aspects. So it only had aspects. Yeah. So tenses were a later development, as far as I know, in terms of the and, and what, current what, thought about. What, so can you give a little bit of an explanation of what you mean by aspects? So aspect has to do with mm. the relative time rather than the absolute time. So if something is ongoing with another event or is completed before another event, so perfective. Yeah. Um, See, to me, that's when you describe it that way, that's tense. If it's completed before another event. I mean, that's just relative tense mm -hmm. as opposed to absolute tense. I'm familiar with aspect in Greek mm -hmm. where it, overlaps with tense and there's a little bit of it in Latin and in English and in French, right? Mm -hmm. we, so I, I just feel like this, it's one of these things that's hard to talk about, but we see it mostly in continuing versus perfect mm -hmm. is the most common. So when we're talking about I walk versus I am walking, mm -hmm. that's aspect, right? Those yeah. are both present. Yeah. Theoretically though maybe not. But anyway, the aspect is what's different. I am walking is a continuous action, which says that there's an ongoing action. Mm -hmm. I walk is a statement that m might be tenseless, but could also be, I walk to the store and that's a completed action. Even though it's in the present, mm -hmm. it's a bounded action. It has a beginning and an end. Yeah. Whereas I am walking does not have a beginning or an end. Yeah. In the past tense, you have, I was walking versus I walked mm -hmm. or I have walked. Those are three different aspects. Yeah. All of them in the past tense in our thinking, but I was walking again, no marker of beginning, no marker of ending. I know you know all of this. I'm just, I think it's helpful to, to mm -hmm. uh, I walked, no marker of beginning or ending, but also no marker of continuance. Mm -hmm. I have walked definitely says this has been completed. completed yeah. doesn't necessarily tell you how, when it started, but you know that it began and ended. So you're saying that in Proto-Indo-European, there were markers of whether it was continuing or. Well, this is why when you use an imperfective aspect, mm -hmm. you're, you're expecting there to be another verb, right? Mm. Like you never use it on its own or you would rarely use it on its own. I was walking to the store when. Yeah. When what something happened, happened what yeah. happened, right? So the, it's always implying Unless, the there's other, another, there's a reference point, right? Yes. To some extent, there's the other use of the imperfectives is the habitual, habitual, yeah. which doesn't necessarily yeah. require that. I used to walk to school. Yeah. But so this is the mm -hmm. thing, like imperfective, you can have an imperfective in the past, in the present, in the future. It can, mm -hmm. in terms of absolute time, you can put it anywhere, which is why there are many verbal systems that have you multiple know, futures with this or multiple presence combination multiple, of yeah. aspect and tense. So you can have both the tense category and each tense has multiple aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, which we might just say as different ways of saying the present, yeah. for instance, or different ways of saying the future, yeah. but when you drill down. So only aspect, no tense is the way that it's currently theorized. That's my understanding. Now, of course, the problem with doing any kind of reconstruction of Indo-European is there's no direct evidence, no. right? So you're basing this on what, what are, what the, are the, the, the tense and aspect systems of all the languages well, so that that's come from Proto-Indo-European? So that was my, that was what my question was going to, my follow-up question yeah. was going to be is in, in Indo-European languages, what are the common ways of handling the future? Because you've talked about the Germanic right. one doesn't have a future historically yeah. and then develops ways of dealing with the future. But the Latinate and Latin and Greek being mm -hmm. my other ones I know as sort of older Indo-European languages, both have developed futures. Yeah. So this what is... else do we have like as, as gr family groupings? Right. So this is a particular hallmark of all the Germanic languages yeah. is that the verbal system is, is massively simplified, right. right? To just two forms, present, non -present. present and non-present. Right. And so I don't want to say you don't all, know, but I know you don't know all the other most, languages, but yeah. Most other uh, Indo-European languages have more complex systems of tense and aspect. Right. Germanic is having, the odd one out okay. for what happened to the verb system. Okay. So it got simplified to this bipartite system of 
past and non-past. Well, basically it, it developed two kinds of past tense, two ways of doing it. So there was what are called the strong verbs, which form their past tense from having the vowel of mm -hmm. the stem chain. But again, this is like what we're talking about with the future in Latin, right? Some verbs go one way, one way other, other, other verbs, verbs go the other way. Yeah, this so they're not two, two, two sep completely separate categories of verbs. And yeah. they're not two different meanings. No. Because no one verb can have both. Yeah. yeah. No one verb so, can yeah, have both. Strong verbs change the vowel. The weak verbs add an ending. So the weak Very verbs add that, broadly. what's called the dental suffix, the Either, ed yeah. in, in modern English, yeah. right? Where you add ed to make the past so tense. This is walked. the sink, sank, sunk versus walk, walked. Yeah. And so that's part of this massive change that happened to Germanic all the Germanic language or right. that whole okay. branch of Germanic languages is that they lost all that complexity. And then took this particular route of and doing their non-presence. They just have these two ways of doing the non-present. Right. They either went for the, they either kept the old fashioned ablaut Which is the change series, of the, the change of the, the oh, vowel, vowel of the stem, or they went the other way and you just add this dental suffix. Mm -hmm. Okay. The last question I have before we go into our third hour uh, <laughs> talking about this and you talk about timekeeping very briefly. Your dissertation was on the ways that Latin, what one of the things your dissertation was talking about was the ways that Latin may have influenced the development of the English future tense, mm -hmm. right? In terms of sort of the movement away from this modal. Or at least how old English speakers mm. handled the Latin. Yeah, I know, but that's in a sense that means that, yeah. that me and whether it's Latin or Christian or whatever, that means mm -hmm. that it's, Latin is influencing Old English, not because mm -hmm. of content. Well, I mean, I, it's a very specific vector. And that's kind of my point. How did that get into spoken in English is kind of my question, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you're talking in these things about what are obviously influential issues, right? Like mm -hmm. translations of the Bible, translations of early church fathers that get used in sermons. These are things that become disseminated and Alfred's texts become disseminated, but still realistically, that's a small portion of the population who mm -hmm. ever read a single piece of written old English, mm -hmm. much less a translation of a Latin piece. And the knowledge of Latin itself would have been confined to an even smaller amount of people in terms of people who could have sort of even had this kind of understanding of how the two languages lined up or didn't. And yet English as a whole mm -hmm. changed. Do you have any thoughts about the mechanisms there? I mean, obviously it happened. You don't have to prove mm -hmm. to me it happened, but in terms of that mechanism for that transfer, and I know that's not what your dissertation was not arguing that like Alfred translating Boethius is what made English develop a will future, right? I know that's not the causal relationship you were talking about, but it's kind of a piece of it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about how that worked? Yeah. So, I mean, this goes back to what my initial ambitious plan of <laughs> including middle all English. Of the, all of the English. <laughs> yeah. So middle English is sort of the wild west of verbal construction. Yeah. It's, it's just Everything crazy. goes until suddenly nothing and, does. And, <laughs> and there's, I mean, partly it's what evidence survives from what period. So, yeah. you know, we have a relatively limited corpus of old English material. We have much more from Middle English, especially late Middle English. But again, there's a geographic specific. But, it's, but we have a that. much yeah. better idea of dialects in Middle English. I mean, most of what survives in Old English is West Saxon, yeah. you know, one dialect. There's bits and pieces of other stuff. And obviously there were people speaking in yeah, but different we areas. Don't know what they were saying. We don't know what they were saying. And there was a huge influence in the later Old English period, geographically in terms of the North and the South. Mm -hmm. So in the North, they were obviously more influenced by Old Norse. And though we don't really see this in Old English, it becomes apparent in Middle English. So clearly they were already doing it in Old English, but it just doesn't get written down. They were borrowing the Norse auxiliary that was used for constructing the future. So Muna, basically it means it's the mind Unless. word. Oh, oh, I, okay. So I intend, I, I intend to. to, I have in mind to do something. Mm. And so if you look at Northern texts in Middle English, you'll see this use of Muna in some dialects. And I've only looked at this sort of briefly, but it's really stark, the differences in different dialects. So in some dialects, you'll see Shulan, Shao, being used exclusively Mm. Right. For all the future tense constructions and will doesn't even come into the picture really. So it's like, yeah, this it's, is a huge variation in middle right. English. And so, the, I mean, there's got to be a complicated pattern for how this eventually comes into, you know, by the time you get early modern, but, which I haven't worked out because, right. you know, and maybe untraceable. 
maybe largely untraceable, though you could probably, if one were to spend the time carefully going through all the evidence and figuring out the dialects and working all that out, you could probably work out how does this filter through to early modern English. The, the answer is, I don't know, because I haven't done that work, but <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah, really interesting. Enough. And, you know, God, I'm not going to do it now. No, no, I, it's just interesting to think about how what's going on at like, it's one thing to see, say, how a literary trope moves from a highly literate niche thing mm -hmm. out into the wider world because a literary trope sort of sits there and then can be used and then picked up and then disseminated. But when you're talking about something as fundamental as grammar, mm -hmm. it seems very unlikely that, like, one person decided to translate the Latin X way mm -hmm. and then suddenly all of England does that. And probably in Old English, there was some kind of literary tradition of this. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to Middle English, it's all very local and parochial and mm -hmm. because there isn't sort of a standard English, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So everyone's just sort of doing it their own way, the way they speak. Right. And so that's why you get such stark differences between different, not only different dialects, but like different writers, just like an individual yeah. have his own way of doing it or whatever. Right. So yeah, that's a whole big complicated thing. Okay. I just, I was just curious. <laughs> I didn't expect you to answer that necessarily. I just thought it was an interesting point to raise. <laughs> yeah. So if someone out there <laughs> wants to do has that time in their hands, you can write the <laughs> sequel to my dissertation and go through the massive evidence of middle English and figure this out. It would be interesting. <laughs> I would like to read it, but I don't think I want to do it now. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Okay. Tell us about timekeeping. And now this is very good on an audio medium. Stop I'm looking at my watch. watch. Okay. Right. <laughs> so we had the gnomon. Yes. Sundials. Well, as I said in that insert, while King Alfred translated Augustine's soliloquies, he never translated the confessions. Which, which is where he talks about time. Where he talks much more explicitly about time, which is a shame because obviously that would have given us more insight into how old English speakers might have thought about Augustine's breakdown of this tripart time. But King Alfred is involved in the story in another way, coincidentally, in that he appears to be the first clear recorded instance of a European using the candle clock. Oh, okay. So a candle clock measures time by burning a candle with time measurements marked in it. You mark your hours and it burns down, you know how much time has passed. Now, he's not the first ever in the world to use this. The Chinese were known to use the candle clock in the 6th century, predating King Alfred. But these two uses are likely independent inventions. Mm, the, right. At it's that not time, a matter I don't of think diffusion. there's... Yeah. I mean... The, you know, Getting absolutely the Chinese English, invented England. everything and that influence directly influenced a lot of European stuff. Not in this case, probably. There's not a lot of contact at, at this time. So Especially probably, England, yeah. yeah, so probably this is an independent. The advantages of the candle clock are that it doesn't rely on the sun, as in the sundial. So, you know, you can use it when it's cloudy. It doesn't freeze like a water clock. Uh, you, you just anticipated oh, I'm one sorry. of the things I'm about to say, but... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but it's, you know, as a Canadian, well, yeah. <laughs> I know the yeah. problems of a water clock. But the sundial had been used ever since around 1500 BC by the right. Egyptians and Babylonians. And, well, putting aside the freezing bit, it's simpler and requires less maintenance than the water clock. Oh yeah, the water clock is a pain it's in a, pain a bunch ass, of different yeah. ways and it evaporates when it's hot and yeah, yeah. yeah. Which by the way, works by using like a slow drip of water to measure time. I mean, think of a, an hourglass, but using water, I guess, yeah. instead of a sand. A certain amount of water yeah. is gone and that tells you. Yeah. Time. Now, again, the Babylonians and Egyptians seem to be the first to use water clocks as far back as the 16th century BCE, mm -hmm. but it was also used in the ancient world in China, India, Persia, Greece, Rome. So mm -hmm. everyone is yeah. doing this. The Greeks called the water clock a klepsidra. Yeah, klepsidra. Uh, which means literally water thief. So in many ways, though, I guess we've got the Babylonians to thank for kicking off the whole timekeeping endeavor because they seem to be they the really earliest. They were really into it. Yeah. <laughs> and another element that we have to thank the Babylonians for is the division of the day into 12 daylight hours, mm -hmm. probably to reflect the 12-part zodiac. So, you know, it's a nice 
It was as spiritually significant, yeah. I think, a religiously significant number. Mm-hmm. But also because the Babylonians used the sexagesimal counting system, so base 60 instead of base 10, hence also 60 minutes, 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. And so mathematically that works nicely with 12 because of the 12 can be divided into fours and threes. 60 can be divided into fives and yeah. fours and threes. and Yeah, yeah. so the, the all mathematical reasons why this just works out neatly. But the real obsession with time began in the Christian monasteries of Europe. And it's all because of their praying schedule that they were so interested in this. So in order to hold the necessary services at the appointed times, matins at sunrise, sext at midday, known at mid-afternoon, vespers at the end of the workday, and compline in the evening, they therefore needed to keep track of time in a pretty specific way, detailed yeah. way, but there were some problems. So sundials, as I said, wouldn't work at, at night. Eight, which is the time when you really need really, to know yeah, what time yeah. it is because you're asleep yeah. and you need to be woken up. Or on cloudy days. And, and in England, it's always cloudy. It's always cloudy. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> and the, the water clocks, as, as you mentioned, would tend to freeze in the northern monasteries in the colder months. And candles were expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And so often what they would just do is like appoint one of the monks with the job of tracking sort of natural cues like the cock crowing in the morning. But the problem with that is that that one guy in charge had to stay awake all night, leading to what is now a children's song, Frère Jacques. Would you like to... Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous, sonnez les matines, sonnez les matines, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. For those who don't know... French, Brother John, uh, wake up! Are you sound sleeping? the matins? <laughs> <laughs> are you sleeping? Are you sleeping, Brother John? Brother John, morning bells are ringing. Morning bells are ringing. Ding dang dong. Mm-hmm. Which is not quite the same, but yeah. So the church were obviously invested in developing better clock technology for keeping time. Now let's pause for a moment and consider this word clock. Mm-hmm. Where does it come from? It's related to French cloche meaning bell from Latin clocka, which may have come originally from a Celtic word. It's uncertain, but that may be the case. So originally a clock was just that, a bell. And so in the monasteries, when it was the appointed time for a prayer, someone would ring a bell to call the monks to service. So Brother John, right? He just, you know, noticed Oh hand, God, now's the time. A handbell yeah. or the bell whatever in the tower is. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it was only later when the bell was attached to some kind of mechanical timekeeping device that the word clock transferred from the bell to the timekeeping device. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now we don't know who invented the mechanical clock, but they start to appear in medieval Europe in the 14th century. Now, initially these clocks often, you know, contained we say in in clock towers, didn't have clock faces. They just rang the bell. So the mechanical device would run and ring the bell. There was nothing to look at. Every hour or whatever, there would just be a bell. bell Not necessarily six bells for six o'clock. It would just be a bell bell on the hour. Yeah. Yeah. The dial, when it was eventually added to clock towers, was developed from the old sundials. And so that the reason that's why it has the same number of hours. That's why it has the same number of hours. And that's the reason that we have clockwise and counterclockwise, because the circular motion of the clockwise direction follows the the movement of the shadow on the, the sundial sun, in the northern, northern hemisphere. hemisphere. Right. It's the opposite way in the southern hemisphere, but this was invented in the northern hemisphere, so that's that's the way it goes. So that's why we have the clock face, you know, no. the way we do. It's right. it's just, you know. It's a vertical yeah. sundial. Sundial. The word dial, by the way, comes from Latin dialis, meaning daily from DA's day. So mm-hmm. dial is specifically the day. from the day that. Matters, yeah. yeah. Now, these early mechanical clock dials had only one hand to indicate the hours because the clocks just weren't accurate enough for measuring anything smaller. And people didn't need it. They didn't need it. Yeah. Because as I say, the point of this was was for the marking the the prayer hours. So, but over time, as there were technological improvements to these early gravity driven clocks, improvements like Christian Huygens or Huygens. 
to give the correct to attempt the correct to attempt the of correct the Dutch name. Yes. Dutch name. His invention of the pendulum driven clock rather than the straight gravity, you know, so a weight pulling down to turn the thing, but the pendulum swinging, which is more, more accurate. accurate. So his innovation, also the innovation of Robert Hooke's improvement to spring driven clocks. So that's mm. another way to do it. And Daniel Quare's edition of the concentric minute hand. And so with all of those developments, the clocks became more accurate and additional division became possible. possible. Yeah. So the word minute is related to the word minute, spelled the same, pronounced differently in English, but they are, they come from they the, are same the same word. They the same word for once. <laughs> yep. So they come from Latin minutus, meaning small. And that word was used in the Latin phrase pars minuta prima, the first small part. Or in other words, the first division of the hour into 60. Into smaller minutes, parts. Yeah. Smaller parts. And then second in turn comes from the phrase pars minuta secunda, the second small part. So the second division into even smaller segments. And so the Latin words meaning not only second, but also following comes from the verb sequi to follow. And so that leaves only the word hour to etymologize. It can be traced back to Greek, in this case, Greek hora, which rather vaguely referred to a period of time or season. Yeah, it's the seasons most. Really? Like, that's what the horai, who mm -hmm. were goddesses, are the seasons. And ultimately coming from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning year or season, which through the Germanic branch also gives us the English word year. Right. Greek hora also gives us words such as horology, which is the science of time, French horloge, 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 yes, horloge. we, do not pronounce, we don't pronounce the H, sorry about <laughs> we that. We only spell them. Yeah. Remember, everything is silent. <laughs> <laughs> French horloge, meaning clock, and horoscope, literally period of time watcher, which brings us back to the notions of prediction and the future. And what's more, the metaphor of the clock was particularly important during the Enlightenment, in which it was used to conceptualize at least uh, one idea about the universe, yes. the clockwork universe set in motion by God, the cosmic clockmaker. Who just set it going and let it go. Let it and go. And was not therefore interfering. Yeah. And it was all sort of predetermined because he made all the gears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was particularly influenced by the laws of motion that Sir Isaac Newton discovered. This very the idea deterministic that this is ca yeah, motion. Causal, cause and effect are inseparable. Mm -hmm. So for Newton, as long as you knew all the conditions, you, knew you, the could, you could predict absolutely the result. This is a very deterministic universe, which was completely predictable. And it's, I suppose, an interesting note you know, to bring it back to the insert. and Catholics. Well, that too. But also <laughs> in terms of, so Newton's physics being kind of thrown on its, on its ear by Einstein's universe. Right. Which kind of shows the problem of this very predictable clockwork mm -hmm. universe Metaphor, yeah. and shows that time flows differently in different parts of the universe. And that um, cause and effect don't necessarily function. You, though, as I say, Einstein himself was initially really upset by that idea <laughs> to accept the fact. But I think he knew that that he was that what was coming out of what be. he was saying yeah. was not gonna was not gonna be what he wanted it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and we're left with the now philosophical scientific problems of: Do we live in a deterministic or or chaotic universe? Chaotic yeah. universe. You know, do we have free will? Who knows? That's all a simulation. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was quite the epic journey. Well, if you give me a topic like this. I didn't. You did. <laughs> uh, <it's> true. <laughs> but no, it was all very interesting. But I'm not going to tell you how long we've been talking. I'm just going to say, I think we should be done. I think it's time to finish now. <laughs> but there'll be more, as I said. So... Stay tuned. You've been warned. <laughs> All right, good. Well, I'm finished my drink. You need to eat the rest of your bananas. Mm. <laughs> and it's time to go. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. 
And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.